These raids resulted in the arrest of 21 suspects and the seizure of suspected heroin, cocaine, marijuana, currency, weapons, including assault off shotgun. The Murphy Home. The Murphy Homes housing project was number one on the city's narcotic task force hit list. They had been staking out the high rise in search of drug dealings, which paid off with this morning's drug bust. Authorities say their latest effort to crack down on drug trafficking and other related crimes in housing projects will consist of narcotic officers routinely staking out the hallways and premises of various units throughout the city. Residents say the new program is the best thing that's happened to the Murphy Homes project in a long time. I love it because um, I have an eight-year-old son that doesn't have anywhere to play. When you um, invite my company around, you're afraid to come around because of the drug addicts. My kids can have somewhere to play and um, forget about the danger and all that. And I'm just so happy they are really doing this. Residents say they can see the results of police patrolling already. Dolores Ramsey, new scene two. Yeah, number fly beats are floating around in this from out of the road, oh, it's about to pop off, y'all. It's about to pop off. And laser freeze. you never seen that shit before. Told y'all niggas it's about to pop. Here we go. Come on, New man. York, we got y'all yeah. niggas up top. Fuck this. Oh, New York. York. Hold me damn, nigga, oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. I'm actually suspicious uh -uh. Police try to get money and sell my pictures To the star legend Stop Inquiring minds wanna know How pretty toned get robes and soft as snow Where the bird go, that shit flew south for the winter While my piece sold the face the size of place at dinner Was masquerade a true story yeah. What happened to the clans? Did I really dodge death? Am I the true Iron Man? Yo, this is laser face Up with up the fun crust for dance to this My legs sweep your running man stance with my contaminant Big hardly arty, semi-retardedly brawny Ungodly shot for me Put holes in your body heat Bang, abort your eminence Front with coal hanging it Limp up with a set of the altercation Without anger Oh, is that the shit you running with? Bitch with a pair of scissors Come cope with a Brooklyn word Pope and Tony the Iron Wizard Like, mind to the fans and your tape Hide your face, Just hide your face Just because radio will play you Doesn't mean that you're great Baby heads talking shit in my face Hide your face, hide your face We hold the legends Every breath that we take You ride it dirty with your man to the place Hide your face, hide, hide your face Hide your face, make sure to keep a light on the brakes You been drafted by the United States Hide your face Hide your face, 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 hide
Distinguishing features, a lazy right eye and pock marks around the nose and mouth. Police officers throughout the city have been provided with a description of the suspect. They've been advised that he may be wounded and they're checking all doctor's offices and hospitals within their working area on a very, peri very routine, periodic basis to see if this individual may seek medical treatment. None of the people who live in this building will talk with us on camera for fear of retribution. But one man, a friend of the woman who was robbed in the elevator last night, says she believes her life was saved by the police presence. She told him the suspect held a gun at her head until he heard the police radio as the elevator approached the first floor. Meanwhile, a community organization in another part of the city, Irvington, is offering a $1,000 reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the suspect don't like seeing our police officers shot down, particularly when they're doing their job. They lay their lives on the, on the line every day when they're doing their job, which is to protect us. And I think it's important, and we want the wounded officers and also uh, all our Baltimore City police officers to know that the community does, in fact, support them, and we're in their corner 100 percent. Anyone with information about these shootings should call the City Homicide Department at 396-2721. Joyce Jefferson, News Scene 2. The Annapolis Police Department has 101 members. Of that number, only 10 are black, and out of that number, eight have filed racial discrimination charges. The latest charge was filed Friday. Carter Boston claims he was fired because he's black. He had been hired as patrolman by the department on July 6th of last year and was to complete his probationary period last week. He was told instead he had been fired. Blanks is, is a very uh, controlled type of environment. Uh, it doesn't, I don't think, give us a lot of opportunity, uh, again, I say, for success. Corporal Robert Beans is president of the Black Officers Association. I think this is an ongoing practice of discrimination within the uh, Napa City Police Department, and I think it still falls in the same category of discrimination against blacks in the areas of hiring, promoting, also uh, supervised positions. All of these, I think, is in the same package of trying to bring about the problem that we have with the Annapolis City Police uh, Department on the racial uh, issue. Officials at the Annapolis Police Department will not comment on any of the discrimination suits. They say there is departmental policy not to comment on any pending litigation. Lou Davis, News Scene 2, Annapolis. Almost a hundred people came to the lottery offices at the Rotunda in Baltimore City today to collect their second place lotto prize money, including James Hill, who rode over from Suitland, Maryland on his motorcycle to pick up $2,046 for picking five out of six numbers. It's better than nothing, but not quite as good as uh, four million. That's true, that's true. Uh, but this uh, take us a pretty good way. <laughs> Where are you going? Well, well, it won't take me, it'll take my wife. It's her, it's really her check. <laughs> she won this one. Everyone who won the $2,046 was glad to get the money, but sorry that they didn't win four million. Well, how's it feel to be a uh, second place winner? <laughs> <laughs> not lucky enough, you know. Uh, I'm happy. Uh, guess I'll pay some bills. Have a little party. Thank you. I wish I could afford some tickets to the Redskins game. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I can sit home and watch it on TV. I'll be all right. Yeah. You, know? you mean if you'd won that $4 million, uh, you'd be oh, on your way for million. the Super Bowl? Absolutely. Tampa Bay, here I come. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, there's still time. Yeah, true, true. Next week? Next week. Right, five million. Five million. I didn't know it till today. I went to cash my ticket in at Ross's Liquor on Old North Point Road, and he said I had five numbers instead of four. I thought I only had four, and he said I had five. I was a big winner. Next week, a lotto winner will get five million dollars. And here's the ticket right here, folks, mine. And if it is, you may never see me again. Retirement, here I come. I'm Susan Y. Bowden, New Scene 2, The Rotunda. The call came in shortly after 3 this afternoon. A robbery in progress at the fabric shop just across the street from the state capitol. Shots had been fired. Annapolis police rushed to the scene. Capitol security made sure the blinds were drawn in the governor's office and he was kept away from windows during the incident. One man trapped inside the building was escorted to safety by police. Earlier, the gunman had tried to escape out of a second story window. He had been shot in the chest, but police kept the area cordoned off until they determined that he was acting alone. The gunman was treated at the scene and then taken to Anne Arundel Hospital by ambulance. 
He was later transferred to shock trauma where he is listed in critical condition with a bullet wound of the left chest. Craig Myers was on Maryland Avenue at the time. Young man ran out the top window, broke out the top window, started running across the rooftops with the policemen after him. They were down on the street and he fell down in the alley and they ran into the alley and apprehended him back in the back of the alley. Police say there were no other injuries. Lou Davis, New Scene 2, Annapolis. At the height of the blaze, flames shot 20 feet into the air. The forms of 150 firefighters silhouetted against the sky. Smoke curled in the wind that carried the inferno raging through this Pimlico neighborhood. It began shortly before 10, a small spark in this G&M oil delivery truck, and it spread while residents watched their homes go up in flames. I heard the oil truck come up in the alley, and it made so much noise, I didn't know what was wrong with it, but it finally cut off. And then all of a sudden I heard a funny sound, like something, you know, make a whoosh sound, and I looked out the window and the whole front of the oil truck was on fire. We had a uh, engine fire, and evidently the gas lines let go, and then gasoline started flowing, and he was pumping oil, or at least he had his line off to start pumping oil, and finally the fire involved the <coughs> oil hose, melted it, and then we got oil running down the alley. And We're told the oil truck exploded like a 4th of July rocket, spewing burning oil on everything in sight, setting ablaze 10 homes and at least five cars. One by one, the fire just got a hold of them and just started going down the line, and it went up the line. You know, it just really got them real quick. It didn't take no more than about 15 minutes, I guess, to get all of them. The fire came too fast. It was just nothing you could do. So most of the people came out half clothed. Then you had to go back in and get blankets and coats, and as you can see, there's very little that you could put on besides that. But it was a real uniform effort, everybody to get them out, and that's how we got them all out safely. Some elderly residents had to be carried out of their burning homes, and officials say it was a miracle no one was killed. Only four minor injuries were reported. The Red Cross and representatives from the Park Heights Multipurpose Center were quick to respond to the call for help. Dozens were left homeless. Oh, we're going to have to reevaluate the situation in the morning, look at the houses, see whether or not they, can, they are condemnable or what the circumstances are. It officials from the G&M Oil Company say it was an unfortunate accident, one they're ready to pay for. We'll be doing everything that we can to make sure that uh, the people are, are settled and uh, that uh, whatever losses uh, our, our insurance company uh, has been notified and that we're fully insured to take care of whatever losses there are. The company estimates at least a thousand gallons of heating oil was in the truck when it exploded. Lynn Alexander, News Scene 2. Everything is total. This is her corner house here. The corner house right here is my house. It's total. Everything. Everything. Everything is gone. The grim faces tell the story. The cold light of day revealed just how much was lost. The residents of the ten houses talk back and forth to each other from charred porches about their losses. Not a thing in the world in here can he do nothing with. It's just gone, baby. The area looked like a war zone, burned out houses and burned up cars. In the middle of the mess sat the oil truck where the fire started. It looked like it had been bombed. The 500 gallons of oil still in the truck were pumped to another truck so that the burned up truck could be towed safely away. Some of the people here were totally wiped out, all of their possessions lost, but they were just that, possessions. By some miracle, no lives were lost in this disaster. And the people who lost all of these things now are determined to put their lives back together. Praise the Lord. We hope that well, I, I, I think everybody will be able to because my, 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 my sister, she have insurance, okay? Okay, they, they got to sue the oil company because that's where it started from. from, from and it, it, because all these insurance companies, I know it's going to be a fight, you know, it might be a hard battle, but I'm sure they're going to get back in their homes. The residents of the 2500 block of Quantico Avenue just thanked the Lord that no one was killed. That, that was a miracle in disguise because there are times you hear on the news and you see on the news where one house, there's eight, nine deaths in one house, and look at 10 houses, nobody lost a life. Now, isn't God beautiful? The Red Cross was on the scene today, as were community workers and the people from the city housing department to help find temporary housing for the burned out residents. But it was primarily neighbor helping neighbor that got these fire victims through the day after this disaster in Baltimore City. I'm Susan Y. Bowden, News Scene 2.
Bernard, Big Head Brother Lee's drug ring during the 70s was so lucrative, according to a witness at Lee's 1975 trial, Lee had a closet full of money piled to eye level. But in court today, Lee was dressed in drab, inexpensive clothes. And his lawyer, Howard Glazer, claims that Lee is now just a has-been and a drug user, buying drugs for his own use, not to sell to others. But in tape-recorded conversations Lee had with his drug supplier last fall, Lee bragged that his wife had set fire to $110,000 in cash just to prove she loved him even without money. Lee also talked about alleged drug deals. A major drug supplier in Baltimore, Bernard Purdy, is the key witness for the prosecution, and he's been granted immunity and guaranteed federal protection in return for his testimony against Lee and against Johnny Clinton, a public school security guard also accused of being a drug dealer. On September 30th of Friday, Purdy met with Bernard Brother Lee and Johnny Clinton here on Poplar Street between Baltimore and Lombard. Purdy was wearing a hidden recording device, parked his car, and they got in. Lee was in the back seat, Clinton up front next to Purdy. A recording of their conversation was played for the jury today. Big Head Brother Lee allegedly pulled out a gun as they talked about a murder contract Lee reportedly had out on Purdy because he thought Purdy had cheated him. Purdy agreed to get more drugs for Lee and for Clinton. Lee and Clinton were arrested when those drugs were delivered. Defense attorney Glazer says he will destroy Purdy's credibility on cross-examination and prove that federal authorities are persecuting, not prosecuting, Big Head Brother Lee because they're angry about his release from prison on previous drug charges. I'm Jack Bowden, News Scene 2. The woman who lives in this house in Baltimore's Kenilworth Park section is the new national president of the nation's largest civil rights organization, the NAACP. Anolia McMillan was unanimously elected to that post after serving the organization for 49 years. Today, as we comb through McMillan's old papers and clippings, it was obvious her battle for equality for black Americans began even before she joined the NAACP. Within three years of graduating from Howard University, she was principal of the only black high school in Charles County. And when the system there refused to pay for a school bus for black students, McMillan raised the money privately. There was uh, no facility, no public transportation to get the youngsters from one end of the county to the other. So we started up a little bus system, bought a second-handed bus and ran it all the way from uh, Rock Point to Pamunkey. That was a distance of about 40 miles. The youngsters had to come each day. Before you put the bus system together with children living as far as 40 miles from the schools, how did they get to school? They didn't get there. That was our concern. They really, they had no way of getting there. When they finished the elementary school, most of the time, their education was over. McMillan made waves again with her master's thesis at Columbia University. Her study exposed the system of paying black teachers throughout Maryland salaries well below those paid to white teachers of equal training. It sparked a campaign to change that system. Eventually, McMillan moved to Baltimore, where in following years she became the first female president of the State Colored Teachers Association, the first president of the State Conference of NAACP branches, and one of the first two black teachers assigned to teach at a white school. She also was the first black assigned as an administrator in Baltimore's school system after integration. She also found time to be a wife and mother, and now, at 79, the grandmother of three. Enolia McMillan shows no signs of slowing down, she talked about her major concern as she begins a new venture as national president of the NAACP. The need for economic development, because you might have political rights, you might have educational opportunities, but if you don't have an economic basis, you're still begging somebody else for jobs. In Nolia McMillan, the NAACP's new first lady. Joyce Jefferson, News Scene 2. Melvin Hughes, seen here with his wife Ella, checked out Diamond Cab 886 on Saturday. At about 10 o'clock Saturday night, the company received an anonymous tip that one of their cabs was here, near the corner of Morley and St. Joseph Streets. It was cab 886. Sunday morning, they picked up that cab. Police say moving the cab makes their investigation difficult. For a period of over 24 hours, that cab was being used to carry fares. Certainly any evidence that was in the cab during that time was, contam was contaminated and its evidentiary value diminished. Uh, it'll have, certainly have an impact on our investigation. Melvin Hughes worked for the F.S. Catania Company. Late this afternoon, we talked to Catania. He told us he was under orders from his attorney not to talk about the case, but he did say there was no blood inside of the car. The only question I want to know is 
why the cab was moved. There was no blood there, and this happens all the time. Freelance because drivers. Because dispatcher called, that's all. I see. And he just picked up the cab. I don't want to say no more. Now, just about two hours ago, two county detectives took the door removed from cab 886 as evidence. The cab had been picked up by county police at 11 o'clock last night, but the door had been replaced. At a little after 5.30 tonight, 24-year-old John Sefkin and his sister, 20-year-old Teresa Ann of Baltimore City, crashed into the Beard Creek. Miraculously, they survived tonight, but residents say this is not uncommon. Albert DeSiris and his family have only lived in the Berkshire community in Anne Arundel County for three months now. They say this is the fourth near-air tragedy for their community that they know of. And tonight's near miss was just too close. The plane was coming over our house, and it looked like it was going to come into our house and hit it. And uh, it looked like the engine died. And uh, he tried it to uh, regroup and get the engine back, started rising back up and hit the back of the trees behind my house. Luckily, the plane didn't hit their house, slapping instead into the Beard Creek, just a mile away from Lee Airport. 14-year-old Doug Cober, a former Boy Scout, used a nearby catamaran to pull 20-year-old Teresa Ann Sefkin to safety. Oh, she, she was, um, I think, in shock, and she said, um, she said her head, her face felt like it was peeling off, and she wanted to know if there was newspapers, and her mother was going to kill her, stuff like that. She seemed to be in shock then. Yes. The pilot, John Sefkin, walked out of the plane shaken but unhurt. His sister, Teresa, was taken to Anne Arundel General Hospital for a broken nose and lacerations. No one else was hurt. But Al DeSeris is afraid luck won't smile on this community next time. Right, absolutely. I'm very frightened about it. And I, I, I plan on doing something about it, and the neighbors are all upset about it. So we, uh, we're going to do something. Okay. In Anne Arundel County, Mike Hofeld, New Scene 2. This is the week most of us gather at home with our families to express thanks for what we have. It's also a time we remember those who have less such as the thousands of people who have no home. Every night, streets such as this one become a bedroom for the thousands of homeless people in our state. They have no place to go, so they end up sleeping in the open. Some city council members want to solve the problem by throwing the homeless in jail. It's one of the worst ideas ever to come out of the council. Throwing people in jail doesn't solve the problem. Every night, nearly a thousand people wander city streets looking for a place to sleep. The lucky ones find a shelter in one of the 10 facilities available to help the homeless. But less than half of them are lucky. The main problem is there are only 364 beds for them. We simply need more facilities. So far, sheltering the homeless has been a task assumed by private charities. But we've reached a point where government can no longer look the other way. City and state officials must face up to the facts. The homeless wandering city streets are from across the state. And most of them are not the bums we imagine. They are struggling families evicted from their homes. They are battered wives fleeing brutal husbands. And they are young men who have left home looking for work. Starting today, the city council must press for funds to provide more beds for our homeless. And most of their efforts should be directed toward Annapolis. State leaders can no longer ignore the needs of these unfortunate Marylanders. To do so is the real crime. We decided to do our shopping at the best little warehouse in Towson, where prices are about as low as they are anywhere in the Baltimore area. Our journey began in the produce section, where we grabbed some celery and mushrooms for stuffing, and some string beans and yams. Next stop, cranberry jelly and pineapple to go with the yams. We'll be conservative this year and stick with cider to wash it all down, turkey gravy, brown sugar for the yams, pumpkin pie, Oh yeah, and turkey, real turkey. Now here's the only clue you're going to get on this holiday version of the price is right, or perhaps wrong. Turkey is as cheap or cheaper than it's been in years. We picked out this 14 pounder for 63 cents a pound. Extra butter for everything, stuffing and rolls, and walnuts for stuffing or cranberry sauce or whatever. Before the moment of truth, I asked some of my fellow shoppers if they're cutting corners Thanksgiving 82 to cope with prices. I'm trying to, you know, cut costs down and buy the cheapest I can, but have the best meal I could. I cut on desserts this Thanksgiving. At my age, I ought to enjoy everything I can. Reaganomics has taken its toll on people like Noran Peterson and her family. I think Reagan's really just made a mess of the economic system. 
It seems like to me the only people he wants to help is the rich and not the poor. Because I've talked to a couple of women over at my sister's place and they're having it rough. Everybody is. Hundreds like her have been calling Contact Who and other agencies looking for a warm place to find togetherness and a hot meal on Thanksgiving Day. So we decided to check out the situation for tomorrow and found good news. Well, we have planned um, turkey dinner with all the trimmings. Uh, we probably will feed anywhere between 500 and 600 people. And uh, it's, it's become quite a tradition, even though we've only been open for two Thanksgivings, to, uh, to have all of our regular people here. And uh, we're really looking forward to it. Daily Bread isn't the only place to turn. Delicious-looking turkeys are already in the ovens at Le Col Cooking School to be eaten at the Sober South Baltimore Emergency Relief Dinner. Both Daily Bread and the Relief Center welcome anyone, and you can just walk in off the street. No tickets and no money needed. You know, that's the only Thanksgiving dinner that the kids will have and that we'll have to be together. And, uh, yeah, we'll be here for Thanksgiving. <laughs> This is The Helping Hand, a private nonprofit shelter set up in Annapolis to house temporarily people who have no other place to stay. It's one of many organizations whose facilities are strained because of increased requests for help. The Salvation Army says requests for assistance are up 20%. The holiday sharing program will be able to handle only emergency requests because this year there are so many. And Evelyn Snowden, who runs The Helping Hand Mercy House, says it will be a bleak holiday here. No, we haven't paid plan of giving out uh, baskets for Thanksgiving because we give out food the whole year round, and we don't have to have wait until a holiday to take and give a person something to eat when they need it. Most of all the time we're full. So it's a lot of time I have to send people away. Oh my Lord, how many things is getting worse? We had people come from other states come into uh, into Maryland here trying to find places to live and trying to find jobs. Mrs. Snowden says that because of the economy, at the time when the need is greatest, the contributions are just not coming in. Lou Davis, New Scene 2, Annapolis. At 15th and K Streets at 12 noon to say no to the Klan and racism. We have another turn, but who do we think will put him in there for another Saturday to fight for what is, is rightfully ours? He is eating steaks, and I don't think it's right that he continue to... On November 27th, we will be joining with thousands of other people in Washington, D.C. and around the country to deliver a clear and unequivocal message to the Ku Klux Klan, their White House supporters, and their powerful businessmen backers that the vast majority of people say no to cross burnings, murders, racist violence, and bigotry and hate. That I am talking about. And I do wish that what... We they had no business doing it. They had no business going into that church. Now they put on. They don't know who they do. They got to know where they're coming from. So we stopped imitating. So we stopped imitating. The family of Timothy Pearlie had planned to spend today at Tim's grandmother's house eating a traditional Thanksgiving Day dinner. But instead of being gathered around a table, they are today gathered around their son's bedside here at the University of Maryland Hospital. Yes, it could have been worse. I'm just glad it wasn't any worse than it, it was. As far as they know, it looks like he's going to recover and be okay? Yes, he's going to be fine. Doctors expect that after a week's stay in the hospital, Pearlie will go home and recover completely. But the worries of his parents and other parents who wait each day for their children to come home from school continue. I was worried constantly, you know, like any mother would be. And I often think about this, you know, I often thought about, you know, that this might happen to him. And I think something should be done. If not, this is going to continue on and on, and this has to stop somewhere. Joyce Jefferson, New Scene 2, University of Maryland Hospital.